Okay, are we ready? This talk is the only thing that stands between you and a day and a half off. So, so uh, this uh, talk counts as either geochemistry three or four, I think. And uh, we've had talks by Bill McDonough and Bill White uh, establishing uh, composition criteria for the Earth and uh, an introduction to trace elements and isotopes. And I'm going to return us to the universe of trace elements and isotopes. Uh, what this talk is going to uh, focus more on is uh, early Earth processes and how you may be uh, interested in using some of the more recent observations regarding the isotopic heterogeneity of the Earth uh, very early in its history to better understand the mixing history and perhaps even the late stage accretional processes of the Earth. So we're going to go back in time primarily for this talk. And this is uh, what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, review some of the promising tools that are currently in use. And if we have time, we'll get to some what I consider promising tools for the future. And I'm going to review some primordial heterogeneities that have already been identified and also speculate on some other types of heterogeneities that we might expect to see in the terrestrial rock record. And I thought I'd start us off by building a planet. And uh, this is an old uh, n-body simulation model produced by Bill Botke, I think, about 10 years ago. So it's not uh, particularly uh, recent. Uh, things to note, this is a semi-major axis in astronomical units, eccentricity, and then time up here. And what you're seeing is the construction of uh, call them terrestrial planets, not the terrestrial planets. They are the terrestrial planets that are produced by this particular model, by this particular run. In this case, again, this is an old one where it has Jupiter uh, sitting in uh, the same place. We'll go uh, look at it one more time. And um, one of the things you can see is it's building bigger bodies. This is the oligarchic uh, growth that was talked about earlier in the week. And these bodies are being built from each other and uh, the small objects. This area here represents, oh, you don't want to own uh, property on that guy that just left off in that direction. Uh, this is the current uh, region of the asteroid belt. So what's the point of this? Dynamical calculations like this, of which there are many, uh, ultimately result in uh, the construction of artificial planets that sometimes look like our inner solar system. Sometimes uh, they don't look so much like our inner solar system. This, again, is a very old uh, figure from a John Chambers uh, review paper 10 years ago. And this just represents the results of four different dynamical calculations. Uh, each one producing, uh, in this case, uh, three bodies, three bodies, four bodies, four bodies. And the shading represents the uh, different uh, genetics of the bodies that are produced with regard to where the genetic materials uh, came from with regard to their distance from the sun. And so the concluding statement with regard to planet building is this. Probably about 99% of the Earth was constructed from compositionally diverse materials. There's still a lot of debate going on as to where those materials came from and as to their compositions. And uh, I'll say this, the average composition is, of course, what we ultimately can look at here. And um, there's even debate, as you heard earlier in the week, as to whether or not it's truly accessible to us. OK, so we built a planet. And what we've done so far this week is we've fast forwarded four and a half billion years. And so I'm going to take us back a bit. But first, a few words. Uh, so Bill White, I think, introduced us to uh, the term chemical geodynamics. Did you? You, you did, right? Somebody, somebody did. Somebody did. And so I just want to point out, this was a term coined by uh, Claude Alleg back in 1982, describing the linkage of geodynamics phenomena to major chemical fractionations. And this was kind of formalized in a paper by uh, Zindler and Hart that uh, the front page of is shown here. 
And uh, that was, what, 1986, something like that. And it's ended up in the production of fancy diagrams like this, which uh, Bill White spent a lot of time talking about the different uh, genera of uh, components within the mantle today. Now, results like this have commonly been put together with the geophysical data that uh, have been produced by and interpreted by people in this room. So we've seen this figure before. Boy, this is now getting to be old. Luis, you're going to have to come up with a, a, a new version. But this is a nice one because it's so beautifully colorized. And uh, so basically, a lot of the community spends time taking isotopic and compositional data and putting it together with seismic data and other bits of uh, geophysical data to come up with a model like this. And that's great, and that's what we have spent a lot of time discussing so far. I'm going to coin a new term, the new term, because it spins, you know it's new, primordial chemical geodynamics. So the question here is, uh, most of what we focused on so far this past week is the current uh, state of the Earth. What was the Earth like uh, soon after it formed? And can we learn anything then from uh, chemical geodynamics if we have a way of going way back in time and looking at uh, at least some of the same geochemical parameters that we can look at today? And of course, we're going back in time. So I went to an old textbook and I found a nice black and white picture of a very simple uh, convection cycle for the mantle. I don't think that anyone would necessarily predict this for the earliest Earth mantle, but it does meet my criteria of being black and white. So one of the questions we want to address, and I'm not actually going to answer this, I'm going to throw some of the geochemical data back to the geophysics community here, is what, what was the mixing history of the primordial mantle, and um, how long did it proceed in the ways that maybe we can glean from some of the data that we have? So, I want to point out, I don't think you uh, had any figures that involved uh, data for anything more than about two million years old. So, when I saw that he did not include that, I went back to my talk and changed this. This is an interesting figure that I took from uh, Vicki Bennett's uh, treatise uh, geochemistry <coughs> article uh, that shows neodymium and hafnium isotopic compositions of uh, purported mantle-derived rocks going back in time. And so these are in epsilon neodymium, which you've already heard is the part per 10,000 deviation from chondritic reference, and that's true for hafnium as well. And uh, the author of this obviously wants to drive your eyes to the fact that, gee, we get to some very high epsilon neodymium values and even some pretty high epsilon hafnium values by the time the rock record starts on this planet. And that has proven rather difficult to explain. Uh, this has been known for 20, 25 years. And if you look at this, you see kind of a horizontal evolution region, and then it curves back up. And so there are many questions you can ask about this, one of which is, does this have anything to do with the evolution of the depleted Moore mantle source, which is what this um, article kind of purports this to be. You see a lot of scatter in the data. Are these rocks that are analyzed representative of depleted more mantle 2 billion, 3 billion, close to 4 billion years ago? And uh, for that matter, what is the fidelity of the data? As you go back in time, rocks uh, become more and more highly altered. And so you've got a point here that's an incredibly high epsilon neodymium value for about 4 billion years, is that really the isotopic composition of neodymium at that time? Remember, these are all data projected from present analysis in a lab, zero time, back 3, 4 billion years. So if you have, they are calculated, well, they're, you make a measurement, but then you project back, making an assumption about the parent-daughter ratio. So this is, this is good stuff, but it, uh, there's, there's problems dealing with it. OK, I thought I'd add this slide. Yes, Luis? Just a quick question about the previous figure. Uh -huh. um, what is the, is the, sorry. 
Is that gray line, it's not a fit to this data, right? No, what? no it's kind of a fit to the upper uh, realm of okay. the data. That's what, I, that's what it looked like. I just wanted to ask whether that's what it was. <clears throat> That was a simple question. <laughs> okay, and uh, again, because Bill didn't mention it, I went back and added this slide. Um, as some of you may know, there's been a lot of work in the last decade on Hadean zircons. So we know from places like Jack Hills in Australia that some zircons that formed very early in Earth history survived to return again in uh, sedimentary rocks from which they are extracted. And uh, they're useful because we can measure the isotopic composition of lead in them and extract very precise ages. And uh, because zircons typically take in a whole lot of hafnium when they form and they take in very little lutetium, you kind of have a record of the hafnium isotopic composition of whatever the zircons originally crystallized from at the time. And I don't want to spend any time talking about this other than to note the flip side of the mantle you can kind of see here. This has been used as evidence that uh, continental <coughs> crustal materials were produced very early in Earth history. And that's suggested by this trend down here. And it's also consistent with the oxygen isotopic compositions of some of these uh, zircons. So my point is you can and people have been working on the evolution of the Earth from the other end of the time scale. But uh, even this only goes back to what's the oldest uh, Hadean zircon, 4.3, something like that. 4.4. You're being generous, but OK. And it's not just the lithophile uh, elements that we use to look at mantle evolution through time. Because I like osmium, I threw in an osmium isotope evolution plot. This is for uh, largely commodiotic rocks, but then extends up to ocean island basalts. Uh, this is a gamma scale, which is percent deviation. Osmium has big isotopic variations compared to neodymium. Most of these uh, dots here represent intercepts for isochrons. And you're going to talk about isochrons next week, yes? Um, so these re each dot here represents a lot of data for a suite of rocks. Most of these are commodiates. You can see that most of them plot amazingly along a chondritic evolution trajectory. But some of them show. Yeah, yeah, I'm actually going to come back to commodiates. We've heard the word commodiate a few times in uh, this meeting. Uh, commodiate is a, typically a high MGO rock, a rock with a lot of magnesium in it that uh, is most commonly assumed to form by high degrees of partial melting of the mantle. Usually people that work on commodiates believe they originate from deep in the mantle. What deep in the mantle means means different things to different people. Uh, oftentimes, we're thinking in terms of uh, melting a domain within the mantle uh, 30 to 40 to 50 percent to produce a commodiotic liquid. So there are very important rocks in terms of characterizing the chemical composition of the ancient mantle. And I do say the ancient mantle because most commodiates that we know of formed during the Archean. They started disappearing during the Proterozoic. And we only have, uh, as far as I know, two Phanerozoic uh, occurrences, one being Gorgona Island, which is the GOR here. And there's uh, some commodiates that are about 250 million years old in uh, Vietnam. Yes? Ooh, that's a good question. The common answer to that is the mantle is cooler, and therefore you have less ability to produce the high degrees of partial melting that produce commodities. Whether that's correct or not, I'm. OK, so we're now going to uh, hop on a time machine and go a little bit further back in terms of uh, Earth history. And so this is the theoretical basis for uh, where I'm headed. The final stages of terrestrial growth and subsequent early differentiation led to the creation of mantle domains that developed unique isotopic characteristics. And that's a consequence of radioactive decay, as we'll see. And some parts of the mantle may even reflect different genetics. And by different genetics, I mean we just saw the dynamical model of, or a dynamical model of building the Earth. 
Uh, we're adding potentially genetically different stuff, and I'll define what I mean by that in, in, a, in a little bit, but potentially adding genetically different stuff to the Earth during its final stages of accretion. And we, we may be able to see this. So some of these early form mantle domains we already know remained chemically distinct for long periods of time following primary accretion. We're setting up a good question for mantle dynamics. And uh, it's now possible to identify disparate primordial mantle components. And uh, that's what we'll want to take a look at. Okay, so uh, one thing I want to point out, Ching Shu Yin gave a talk a few days ago and he showed a picture of a mass spectrometer. I want to brag a little bit more about mass spectrometers. Um, they're really boring devices to watch. Um, this, this is uh, one of ours at the University of Maryland. Uh, it has an ionization source here. You spend most of your time in a chemistry lab separating the element that you want to measure the isotopic composition of from its matrix. You form ions here. It goes through a big magnet, magnet and ends up in the collector. The operation of a mass spectrometer is not so important, but what is important for the standpoint of this talk is in the last 10 to 15 years, technology has really improved, and we can now make measurements that at least some people brag are as good as plus or minus two parts per million. That means you can resolve an isotopic ratio from another isotopic ratio that varies only two parts in a million. And that's kind of incredible to me, don't you think? Absolutely, especially when, <laughs> compared to when I started out. <clears throat> I used to be able to measure osmium isotopes <coughs> to plus or minus 1%, and I can measure that same ratio to plus or minus 8 ppm now. That's, that's, that's a lot of... Improvement. No, it's plus or minus uh, plus or minus a, a a few parts per million. It's not. Okay, so there are probably a few people in here that remember the cigarette advertisements from the 1960s. Do you remember this one, Bill? The silly little millimeter longer was a really irritating commercial, and uh, it uh, attached great importance to the additional one millimeter of cigarette length that uh, this brand achieved over all other brands. And this is analogous now to mass spectrometers. The few, uh, the reduction in our ability to measure uh, a few parts per million better precision really is important. That's the point I want to make with this slide, other than to bring back fond memories of your early smoking history uh, from the 1960s. Okay, so I'm going to start off with an isotope system that has been mentioned here already. It's not one that I'm going to focus much on, but we may end up discussing it, and in which case we may not get too much further beyond it, and that is the Samarium-146 Neodymium-142 system. And this is an alpha decay. I show here 68 million year or 103 million year half-life. That's actually still being debated. So this is a system that uh, was extant. It was producing isotopic variability anywhere from, I don't know, 350 million years to maybe 500 or 600 million years. So it's perfectly suited to looking at uh, early planetary evolution processes. And when this was discussed earlier in the week, uh, the big discussion was the fact that, well, let me introduce this uh, figure. This is, this says initial, ooh, that's a mu, which means part per million deviation. So we're working with part per million relative to a laboratory standard. This is time. And what was being discussed earlier in the week is the fact that the mantle today, that would be this uh, band right here that extends across, is offset a bit from carbonaceous chondrites, ordinary chondrites, some enstatite chondrites, but it does overlap with some other enstatite chondrites. I don't want to be drawn down into the 
the muck of that discussion. Uh, you may have recalled that uh, there was some disagreement even between the two bills here as to uh, what that means. It could mean uh, collisional erosion of planetesimals leading up to the formation of the Earth, in which case it's really, really important because it's telling you that maybe the bulk composition of the Earth really, really isn't chondritic. Bill McDonough doesn't like a model like that because that throws a lot of what he does into the air. Um, it may be we have a hidden reservoir, so the Earth is chondritic. Uh, it may mean there is a nucleosynthetic reason for that. I don't want to talk about that. This is really neat, too. This is something that hasn't been mentioned. This is the observation that the Earth's mantle records variability in neodymium-142 in early Earth rocks. And so this is a figure that was produced by uh, Hanukkah Rizzo, who's currently a postdoc uh, shared between uh, DTM and uh, University of Maryland that she did for her dissertation back in France. And she analyzed a whole lot of rocks from Issaquah, Greenland. And uh, this is also combined with other people's data. And you can see large positive, what we'll call anomalies in neodymium-142, differences from the present mantle composition. We even see some negative ones. All these green symbols are from uh, Greenland, some of the oldest rocks that we have on this planet. And so the point that I want to make is there's isotopic heterogeneity in this short-lived system that we didn't know existed 20 years ago. We just started knowing it about 15 years ago. And this places some requirements on the differentiation history of this planet. And one of the things that it shows, oh, and one thing that I want to note is that uh, these heterogeneities appear to essentially be gone by the end of the Archean. So this may be a mixing phenomenon. They may be mixed away. It may be an accessibility problem. Maybe the enriched and depleted reservoirs that these uh, materials are sampling are no longer being accessed by rocks. As far as we know, there are no terrestrial rocks beyond about 2.7 that show measurable neodymium-142 heterogeneities. So they're gone by the end of the Archean. So if you want a mixing problem, that's a good mixing problem. Which yep. Is this related to the formation of continents? Formation of the continent. Or it the it could be if you uh, believe the uh, hafnium data for uh, zircons, which I just showed you. Uh, many people now believe we had at least some semblance of continental crust, high silica continental crust, very early in Earth history, maybe within the first 100 million years of Earth history. And uh, that may be within the time constraints of uh, production of the enriched and depleted reservoirs. Could also be associated with magma ocean fractionation. I want to go to the next slide, which gives you some idea of uh, the time scale for the heterogeneity that we just saw. And I don't want to discuss these figures much because we could spend a lot of time discussing it. The uh, y-axis here is neodymium-142-142. 44 ratio in part per million deviation from uh, the standards that we measure. The uh, three X axes here represent neodymium-143 of the same rocks calculated for 3.7 billion years ago. To make a long story short, where a neodymium-142 and neodymium-143, I should point out neodymium-143 is the long-lived uh, radiogenic uh, decay product of samarium-147. So we have this coupled isotope system that consists of the same two elements, samarium and neodymium, but we have a long-lived system and a short-lived system together. We don't need to go into the details of it other than you need to realize they are coupled. If you fractionate samarium from neodymium, which causes a deviation from a chondritic trajectory in isotope space, you will affect both isotope systems. And so you can go back in time. You can plot the results then against this strange looking pattern. And uh, it actually can tell you a model age for when that fractionation of samarium from neodymium 
relative to uh, chondritic ratio occur? And unfortunately, the answer depends on what you use as your starting composition. So this has three different starting compositions, ordinary chondrites, enstatite chondrites, and something they call EDR. We don't need to worry about it. The only point that I want to make, even the one that gives the youngest possible fractionation age gives a minimum segregation age of 4.3 billion years. The, the one that uh, the, these authors, Rizzo et al. 2011 favor is a, uh, a fractionation event at about 4.47 billion years. So this is a really early Earth differentiation event that is being recorded in these rocks. Okay. And so that raises a bunch of questions. Um, how were these mantle domains created? And how did a record of both domains wind up in a small parcel of Iswa? If I showed you a map of uh, the Iswa area, you would be very unimpressed with how big of an area this is. It's actually quite small. And so this begs the question, is what we're seeing in the Iswa rocks a record of shallow, small-scale processes or large, deep mantle processes? And I don't have an answer to that. That's something people that think about mantle mixing need to think about. As far as I know, no one has really tackled that issue with regard to neodymium-142. Okay. Now we're going to move into the suite of elements that uh, I enjoy working with the most. It's the suite of elements that, because of tutorial one, you are now all experts in to some degree. And I'm going to make the point here that siderophile elements may serve as excellent tracers of late stage planetary accretion and early mantle mixing, the, the stuff we want to talk about here. And just as a really quick refresher course. We normally divide the siderophile element landscape into so-called moderately siderophile elements. And I just want to point out moderately siderophile elements include tungsten, which I will surely mention in this talk. And I may get to a brief discussion of molybdenum as well. So these are elements that like to go into metal. They don't really, really, really like to go into metal, but they do like to go into metal. And as Liz pointed out <gasps> yesterday, the degree to which they like to go into metal depends on a number of things, including composition and oxygen fugacity. Highly siderophile elements, this is what you were modeling on Tuesday. These are elements that at uh, low pressure conditions really, really, really like to go into metal. And uh, you've already then modeled essentially all of these elements except for gold. Okay, why are these elements good for looking at early Earth accretionary processes and early Earth mixing processes or early mantle mixing processes? Well, Michael gave us a hint of that in that uh, slide from the Meyer et al. paper that was published a few years ago, and I'll show you that again in a, in a few minutes. The bottom line is this. These are elements that occur in relatively high abundance in impactors with chondritic bulk composition. So if you have any small planetary body that you want to accrete to Earth, if it has a chondritic composition, overall it has very high concentrations of these elements, not compared to the bulk Earth, but compared to the silicate Earth. And the reason for that is, of course, these elements are largely contained in the core of this planet. And so you have a very strong lever arm in contaminating and adding highly siderophile elements and to a lesser degree moderately siderophile elements to a planetary mantle by impacting bodies with chondritic composition. As, as long as you don't extract the core of an impactor into uh, the core of the Earth. Go ahead. There was the key piece of evidence in the KT impact, of course, was iridium, one of these anomalously mm -hmm. high abundances of that in sediments at that time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we'll get to it, but I also want to point out there is a bonus in here. Some of the siderophile elements, such as molybdenum and ruthenium in particular, show really large nucleosynthetic heterogeneities, which were mentioned in Qingxu Yin's talk. And so if you're adding materials of different gener genetic heritage, 
meaning different isotopic anomalies, this is something that we might ultimately be able to pick up in the rock record and glean something about the building blocks of at least late stage additions to this planet. Yeah? Yes? Um, in your, in your D values, Those are liquid metal solid silicate D values. And those not were liquid metal liquid silicate. Oh, they were liquid metal liquid silicate. Thanks. Okay. So they, were, so they were not liquid metal, solid silicate. Right. right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I was told I should show a periodic table. So here is the periodic table. Uh, surrounded by red are where uh, most of our favorite siderophile elements are. Happy? Yes. Okay. I was ordered to do that. Okay, uh, I showed you a figure uh, that Liz Cottrell compiled about 15 years ago, and she pointed out it was 15 years ago. I have updated it recently, and this is where I think we stand with regard to our understanding of abundances of moderately, that would be the guys over here, and highly siderophile elements in the mantle today. So I think I'm accurately representing the error bars, since geochemists really worry about error bars, with regard to their uncertainty. And so you can see the moderately siderophile elements, by and large, do not reside in chondritic relative abundances like the highly siderophile elements. But even among the highly siderophile elements, you can see a little, a little jitteriness compared to uh, these are all ratioed to C1 or CI chondrites. Okay, where did the moderately siderophile elements in the silicate earth come from? That's a good question, and it therefore relates to planetary accretion, perhaps. And uh, this is a statement that I oftentimes make. Most modern interpretations of moderately siderophile elements invoke high pressure temperature and metal silicate partitioning. I told you that on Tuesday. I didn't really show you any evidence for that. Here are a couple of figures from a couple of papers that maybe will convince you of that. Uh, this is a paper by Jackie Lee and Carl Agee that was published almost 20 years ago. And it's a plot showing you can't read it back there, D-nickel, uh, D-cobalt, uh, the distribution coefficient ratios of nickel and cobalt as functions of depth and therefore pressure and temperature. And to make a long story short, this paper um, concluded that the only way you could get the essentially chondritic cobalt-nickel ratio that we see in the mantle is by partitioning cobalt and nickel between metal and silicate liquids uh, at pressures, well, they considered pressures between about 30 GPA and 40 GPA. And there have been a whole lot of papers published since then making the same case for other moderately siderophile elements. Go ahead. Uh, is, is this figure uh influenced by the oxygen fugacity, or do they consider risk? Well, and let's, uh, I actually don't know what the oxygen fugacity of the experiments were here, but you are presaging where we're headed in the next panel, because this fast forwards about 10 years. And this is a, a very uh, famous model produced by Wade and Wood, and it shows in this case, core mantle concentration ratios and how ultimately they developed a model to produce the concentrations that I just showed you in the previous slide, the abundances that we now measure. These are all uh, moderately siderophile or non-siderophile elements. And the point I want to make about this slide is Wade and Wood actually argued for something that uh, Liz mentioned yesterday. They have a point, oh, and I should point out the x-axis here is the fraction of accreted earth. So we're going from a very small earth to the earth that is full-sized here. And so the ratio of an element like tungsten to from the core to the mantle, uh, according to their model, varied considerably as the earth grew. So when the Earth or proto-Earth was very small and pressures were low and temperatures were relatively low, tungsten was a very strongly, moderately siderophile trace element. But as the planet grew, its uh, siderophilic nature decreased. 
To explain the abundances that they believe we see today, they also included an additional step, which Liz mentioned yesterday, and that is a change in the oxygen fugacity of the mantle. And that's not the point of my talk, but I will mention uh, in their paper, this is then a discussion of disproportionation when you start producing uh, magnesium perovskite. When you've got enough mass to produce magnesium perovskite, you start uh, uh, disproportionating um, uh, ferrous iron to ferric iron and metal, and they called this an oxygen pump for the upper part of the mantle. And so this shift, particularly for an element like tungsten, is really a reflection, according to them, of a change in oxygen fugacity. Go ahead. Uh, that step around, uh, is that tungsten right there? This it seems tungsten. like there's another step earlier with like uh, gallium and is that vanadium and, and manganese? What? Yeah, I would, I would have to go. I, I, in truth, I didn't go back and reread this paper. Um, okay. So I think there are breaks in uh, pressure. And so there are changes in distribution coefficients as functions, not just of changes in oxygen fugacity, but pressure. And that may just be a step function based on the availability of distribution coefficients for the different pressures. OK. OK. Now, um, there, are, there are still issues to debate about this. And uh, if you're interested in this topic, this is a paper by uh, Dave Ruby and a bunch of other people that was published in, uh, I think, 2005 that reviews some of the issues. And they include, did metal silicate equilibration occur between metal droplets and magma ocean as they were falling? So here's a cross section of uh, Earth with a magma ocean. Did metal silicate equilibrium occur at the base of a magma ocean in a ponded metal layer. That's what we essentially modeled on Tuesday. So here's your ponded metal layer. Uh, how many magma ocean events did the Earth go through? If the Earth was uh, built through oligarchic growth with big bodies smacking into each other. We presumably had multiple magma ocean or magma uh, sea effects. And then how does this changing uh, FO2 affect things. That's not what I'm talking about, but it does set the stage. It tells you where they come from. And so again, uh, there's a lot of debate, um, but I think most people in the community kind of accept that. And so to uh, summarize, abundances of the moderately siderophile elements in the mantle were likely established by a variety of uh, metal silicate partitioning events mostly resulting from large-scale accretional events in Earth history. Now, it's interesting to note that uh, final 10% mass addition, which is kind of the canonical explanation for the formation of the moon, could have had a pretty significant effect on tungsten isotopic composition, and if we get to it, molybdenum isotopic composition of the silicate Earth. And the reason for that is, and we had this discussion which uh, may have caused some of your eyes to glaze over about equilibration between uh, metal falling through the mantle at the time of a giant impact. If you have a lot of equilibration, you can affect the isotopic compositions of these elements a lot. If you have very little equilibration, you have a very small effect on isotopic composition. Rich, can you expand on that? I don't think I can get it. So why is the last 10% any different from the middle 10 percent or? Uh, well, you can kind of think of it as a right? distillation process. Yeah. And so uh, if you have a very strongly uh, negative uh, tungsten isotopic composition, which you would if you had a core in your Mars-sized impactor that separated, and if it largely equilibrate, if it, if it blew up into a lot of small pieces, uh, you could uh, affect the concentration of uh, tungsten in the resulting mantle by as much as 30 to 50 percent. Wildly, wildly uh, unlikely scenario, but still. And you could have a really big effect then on the isotopic composition because the isotopic composition of the presumed core falling through would have been so different from the presumed isotopic composition of the silicate earth at that time. We probably don't want to spend a whole lot more time on, on uh, but we could. We can go back to that. Okay, I'll, I'll figure it out on my own. But it's important what you're saying. 
It is. OK, origin of highly siderophile elements. Um, they're here. They're roughly in chondritic relative proportion. You tried to match that in your Tuesday tutorial. You, you didn't succeed. And so I'm just going to make the statement here, which might appall some people, but they're not here, uh, which is the highly siderophile elements that are sitting in the mantle probably were established by a process called either late accretion. Uh, some people prefer the term late veneer. Uh, and it's just simply as you build the planet, you might be building it from undifferentiated or differentiated bodies. Periodically, the highly siderophile elements are almost quantitatively removed from the silicate portion of the body. So here, again, this is all washed out, but we have very low highly siderophile element content. At this stage, maybe the uh, core has ceased to segregate, and so we achieve the abundances that we have by adding in about another half of a weight percent of Earth mass in either the form of differentiated or undifferentiated bodies. It doesn't matter to us, other than, again, if you've got a core in the differentiated body, it can't merge with the uh, proto-Earth, the final um, bit of the Earth. This is an idea that goes back to the 1970s, and you can even track it back even further if you so desire. And as you hopefully learned on Tuesday, probably the strongest evidence for this is uh, osmium isotope uh, data. This is a uh, modal histogram of osmium isotopic uh, data 187-188, one of the two isotope systems we modeled on Tuesday. And uh, you can see where our best estimate of the bulk silicate Earth is today. That's this uh, vertical line. And uh, you can see that it overlaps with data for chondrites. You can see one other thing, though, can't you? It actually overlaps better with the red and the white boxes and doesn't overlap at all with the black. And the black are carbonaceous chondrites. And so osmium isotopic composition is really not a good fit to carbonaceous chondrites. This has been a, a really important issue in the past since a lot of people have argued that uh, volatiles have been brought to the upper mantle by a late accretionary process in the form of typically more volatile rich meteorites like carbonaceous chondrites compared to enstatite or ordinary chondrites. Go ahead. Uh, Rich, um, the estimate on the, of the bulk silicate earth, mm. of the osmium isotope composition of the mm -hmm. bulk silicate earth, is based on samples that have experienced depletion. They've right? all experienced depletion. Does and it mean that the osmium isotope ratio that they have is a frozen isotope ratio, mm. such that the rhenium osmium, the time integrated rhenium osmium ratio is non chondritic uh, it is possible that, uh, and this is published as a minimum ratio, so it could go 1 or 2 percent higher, okay? And uh, that would push it uh, to the edge of the chondritic field, okay? That's another talk, though. I can explain that. <coughs> okay, so summary of, oop, it should be HSE observations, a final approximately half uh, percent mass addition to the Earth in the form of late accretion, late veneer, um, likely established the abundances of these elements. It is important to recognize, though, that it doesn't do much for the moderately siderophile elements. So I can change their budget by maybe uh, 5 to 10 percent, but it's not going to establish uh, tungsten abundances. It does, as we will see shortly, potentially affect tungsten isotopic composition, though. Okay, so now let's uh, consider some examples of how siderophile elements can be applied to the mixing history of the early mantle. And we saw this figure earlier, and it's a really neat idea, and I wish it were true. I'm going to show you some results in a bit that suggest it may not be true. Again, the, these are data from uh, commodities, and we just defined what commodities are, so I don't need to do that again. Uh, this is a particularly valuable element, platinum, in order to determine mantle abundances of the sources of these commodities. And the reason for that is platinum is not strongly fractionated between the mantle and the crust. 
So even though these are typically differentiated bodies, we think we can take uh, highly siderophile element data for commodities and work back to get a pretty good estimate of mantle abundances. So they argued, as Michael pointed out, that um, these uh, earliest uh, commodities that we have in the rock record seem to uh, almost uniformly have depleted highly siderophile element abundances. And by and large, they argue in this paper that these are sourced deep in the mantle. And what we're seeing here is the late veneer being mixed downward into the mantle. And by the time you get to 3 billion years, 2.9, we're back to abundances that are consistent with modern mantle abundances. Where this starts, well, if you project this out, you would project it out to essentially zero prior to late accretion. You would have a mantle that has really, really low abundances. So great idea, really neat problem for early mantle mixing. It just has some problems with it. And so that brings us to uh, what I really want to cover in this talk. And this is uh, research that uh, is going on now. So we've generated quite a bit of data, but I don't think we understand it particularly well. And so this is a great opportunity to take some of these data and uh, run with them yourselves and see if you can come up with better ideas than the silly ones that we have generated so far to date. And so um, introducing the topic of tungsten isotopes back into this meeting. I'm sorry, but tungsten's really, really important. And uh, I want to highlight two papers that were published in the last few years. Uh, one was published by the Bristol Group. And you can see it, the title, The Tungsten Isotopic Composition of the Earth's Mantle Before the Terminal Bombardment. That sounds pretty impressive. And uh, this is the paper we produced a few months later. This was in Nature. This was in Science. 182 tungsten evidence for long-term preservation of early mantle differentiation products. If you're a mantle dynamicist, come on. This, this, this is a title that should interest you, right? Long-term preservation. Good heavens, how could that be? OK, so we need to review this system a little bit. Uh, hafnium-182 decays to tungsten-182. The half-life, about 9 million years. So this is a system. Multiply it by 5. It's gone after 45 million years. So any record of variability in this isotopic composition as a consequence of direct radioactive decay had to have happened within the first probably really 30 million years of solar system history. So we're talking about a system that uh, really uh, pushes time back to some extent a bit more than the uh, Samarium-146 Neodymium-142 system. So go through this table really quickly. These are abundances in chondrites, about 200 parts per billion or nanograms per gram, roughly the same tungsten abundance, hafnium tungsten ratio of chondrites, roughly one. And again, I'm using this terminology here, mu, which is part per million deviation. And you'll see why we have to use ppm rather than epsilon, because the variations are really, really small. So this is interesting. Our reference frame, chondrites, is actually minus 200. Our standards, which are made from stuff like light bulbs, zero. And so unlike what we normally think of for standards like neodymium that is a chondritic composition, uh, we are not chondritic. And the reason we're not chondritic is because the Earth's core formed during the lifetime of hafnium-182 or formed over the period of the lifetime of hafnium-182, thus reducing the tungsten abundance in the mantle relative to hafnium as compared to chondrites and ultimately producing a more radiogenic or higher 182 to some other isotope of tungsten ratio. 184 is what we normally ratio it to. So here's the mantle. You can see the drawdown in the tungsten. Uh, this is the best current estimate of tungsten in bulk silicate earth. You can see the mantle has an excess of tungsten compared to chondrites. Why would that be? Did it manufacture the uh, hafnium? 
It's just because it's excluded from the core. So the concentration goes up. So you have a much higher hafnium tungsten ratio in the mantle than in chondrites. And that's what gets us to the isotopic composition that we have. One interesting thing to note from mass balance, if we assume the Earth has an overall chondritic tungsten isotopic composition, the core must be about minus 220. So if we ever geochemically identify a core component in, say, an ocean island basalt, this is probably the best way to do it. Okay, so let's look at the data from the first paper. This is from the Vilbold et al., the Bristol Group paper. And they analyzed, not surprisingly, ISAWA samples. Why do people keep going back to ISAWA? Well, they're some of the earliest rocks that we have on this planet. And if you're looking for isotopic anomalies, particularly in short-lived systems, you might as well go for the oldest stuff to start off rather than the youngest stuff. So these are all uh, essentially uh, young materials. These are all the ISWA samples they analyzed. Um, they ultimately concluded they had about a 13 part per million positive deviation in 182 tungsten compared to the modern mantle. And uh, as we saw, these are rocks that also have variable neodymium-142 enrichments. Did anybody in this room create this figure, by the way? This is a tomographic image I just pirated off the web and stuck my own isotopic interpretation onto it. <laughs> anyway, um, here's their model. Their model is that the isotopic offset that they see in the Isua rocks is a result of the Isua rocks being derived from mantle that had not yet had its late accretionary or late veneer component added to it. Okay? So if you want to picture it in one of these funky diagrams that uh, you guys use in the world of geophysics, you would have uh, dark blue areas that, for whatever reason, are enriched in highly siderophile elements. They would also have a depletion in... Uh, uh, 182 tungsten because chondrites are strongly negative. And you could perhaps envision these things being created in the mantle as a function of moderate sized bodies impacting and becoming incorporated in the mantle. You might have regions of the mantle that are then clear of highly siderophile elements and these would therefore be enriched in tungsten 182 because they haven't had the strongly negative stuff added to them. So you would have this two-color mantle scenario that you can see where we're headed. Ultimately, this probably gets mixed together and you end up with something that has an isotopic composition that we define as zero. Okay? And it's perfectly good description. You can see it graphically here. Their idea is you would be starting off with an Earth, a proto-Earth that has, well, it's almost a complete Earth. We won't even call it a proto-Earth anymore. Complete Earth that has an enrichment in 182. And as you add your late veneer, you move the isotopic composition of the bulk silicate Earth from right to left. And you may leave some reservoirs or domains within the mantle for some period of time free of, high, uh, free of that late accreted material. Does that make sense? It's consistent with the highly siderophile elements drawing here. Perhaps, perhaps. We'll see, we'll see the tragedy of that idea in a, in a minute. Though. Go ahead. Um, I'm a little confused here because um, so this is showing when the highly when when the late veneer mm. came in, but mm -hmm. then in a previous figure where you showed the 142 neodymium um, isotopic compositions, you spoke about an early depletion or enrichment event. Mm -hmm. How is that related to this, or how is it different? Uh, that would probably be completely unrelated to this. Okay. So this would either be superimposed upon that, or the differentiation event would be superimposed uh, upon variability in late accreted material to the mantle. So here, this model, you wouldn't predict uh, a correlation between neodymium isotopes and tungsten. 
and to some extent, you know, it's actually unfortunately uniform in both tungsten and neodymium space, so it doesn't really tell you if there's a correlation or not. So, okay. And uh, I have one more question. Sure. Um, this can be a knife question, but you say that the late veneer came in from a body that was enriched in highly sidrophile elements. I would say bodies. Or bodies mm -hmm. um, with highly sidrophile elements, but not so much with the moderately sidrophile elements, right? Correct. Um, have we found any meteorites or bodies like that which are selectively enriched in highly sidrophile elements? Yeah, to support that hypothesis. Uh, well, all chondrites have roughly similar abundances of highly siderophile elements and roughly the same tungsten isotopic composition. So it's unlikely you could create a body that uh, wouldn't have chondritic relative abundances and chondritic absolute abundances in the bulk accreting body, I think. Okay. Did that answer your question? I'm not... No. No? What's the question then? Help me um, out What Rich and many of us would feel is that you've just added a chondritic-like material. If you compare, and that's where the words enrich were being enriched was being confused. If you look at a chondrite and what would have been the earth before the addition, the earth would have no uh, highly siderophile elements. Uh, the mantle would have no highly siderophile elements and some depletion in tungsten. Could you go back to your log scale diagram? My log scale diagram? You know where you show the concentrations? Oh, good heavens. That's I know, way it's back. way back there. Uh -huh. So the data dots to the far right are well below, near the bottom, near the floor level, and then you add them in. So you've added them in to that much. So when he estimated a half a mass percent, they re elevated them to there. Rich, could you just point out how much tungsten you would have added with that fraction? I, I can't point it out. I would say you add something on the order of about 5 to 10 percent of the mantle budget of tungsten. I so that doesn't sound like much, but if you have a very dramatically different isotopic composition, yes? I disagree with him. He would have added this much tungsten to the system. Yeah, that's about 10%. 0.01? Right, yes. Right. The whole line would be straight, okay? So that's what y your question really was, is the line from palladium to tungsten would be flat. That's the addition. It's about 10%. But, but the other thing to point out is, is those D values, those highly siderophile elements would have started out below, the ch they would have been off the chart without the late addition. Oh, yeah. OK. Oh, we got another question. What is your model? Do you have a punch through the crust going to the mantle? Oh, yeah. And it doesn't matter, because it would be mixed back into the mantle, presumably by whatever process eliminated so the you, crust. So you think that your kind of meteorites are big enough to introduce the Sudbury class even when it's really punching down? I can or you top have that. a drift <laughs> through the... We or would you argue have that a deposition on the <clears throat> surface and after it's drifting down? Uh, we would argue that they're actually uh, as much as Pluto mass bodies, so uh, something roughly a quarter the mass of the moon. So sizable bodies, okay. not, not giant impacts, but... So they would pass through. Yeah, they, they, they would make a mess of things. Okay? Okay, so uh, if uh, the Vilbold model was correct, again, think in terms of mantle dynamics, it means a siderophile element poor, but tungsten 182 rich domain uh, was present in the mantle and survived for tens to hundreds of millions of years until these rocks were produced. Okay? So if you're envisioning a wildly convecting Hadean mantle, you have to somehow explain this. This is an interesting observation if it's correct. Now, there are predictions that result from that model. One of the predictions is the highly siderophile element abundances in the mantle source of the Isua rocks should be really low, right? We didn't add the late veneer to it, so they should be really low. And the answer is, oh, they didn't measure it. 
But we did, but I won't tell you what we got unless we have time at the end. But unfortunately, it looks like... The answer, yeah. the, I'll t okay, I'll tell you. The answer looks like they have normal highly siderophile element abundances. Okay. See, now you spoiled it for me. <laughs> All right, now uh, we'll move on to uh, the paper that uh, we generated at University of Maryland, and this was a study of some 2.8 billion year old obscure commodities. And the reason we decided to work on these obscure Russian commodities from La Cola Peninsula is uh, that we had previously identified these as having osmium-186 and osmium-187 enrichment in their mantle source. And boldly, 10 years ago, we said, here is evidence of uh, a core component in the commodities, and therefore, early inner core crystallization. So we were excited to work on these rocks, and we expected a negative tungsten excursion in the data and we envisioned a ticker tape parade in New York City celebrating our discovery of core mantle interaction. Yes? I have a seismologist question. Um, you've said Hadean and Archean a few times on the last couple of slides. Can mm -hmm. you remind us of the numbers for the boundary between those ages so we get our ages straight? Yeah. Uh, Hadean, when do we want Hadean to start? Roughly around, simple term, four billion years. And so Hadean before that, uh, Archean after. Okay, the Hadean Archean <clears throat> boundary is defined as the oldest rocks, which are the Acastomyces, which are about 4 billion years. Proterozoic Archean is arbitrarily <clears throat> defined at 2.5 billion years. So, so I hired uh, Mathieu Tabou, who, uh, you know, we planned to get a negative excursion and become famous for this. And he analyzed a whole bunch of rocks and wouldn't tell me what he got. And I guess I should precede this with the statement, since I just told you that it was really important to know the mantle abundances of highly siderophile elements in the sources of the Isua rocks. We didn't make that mistake. These are rocks that have been uh, very well characterized by my colleague Igor Puchtel. And these are projected abundances of these elements in the source of the uh, commodities. And they're pretty normal. They're a little bit low, but pretty normal. So here's what we got. The core, by the way, is way over here. Uh, these were all positive. So uh, it didn't work out the way we wanted. OK, so forget the core component. But this is telling us something else. This is telling us that somehow we produced a reservoir in the mantle. And this is truly a mantle reservoir because we have a consistent tungsten elemental systematics in these rocks that uh, interestingly enough, survived not one, but uh, essentially two billion years in the mantle without mixing out. Okay? And uh, this, is, uh, this is a pretty big anomaly. Okay, so how do you explain that? Well, these are where our very weak models are presented, and maybe you can come up with something better. So we uh, considered a couple of different models, uh, one of which is passing metal through a basal magma ocean. And this would lead to, here we were trying to explain both osmium and tungsten isotopic systematics. And so you can imagine dropping metal through a silicate magma ocean would lead to a, a decrease in the tungsten abundance in this magma ocean, therefore increasing the hafnium tungsten ratio and letting you grow excess tungsten 182. And it would actually uh, likely drive rhenium osmium and platinum osmium ratios up, which would uh, give us the osmium isotopic composition. It makes no predictions about other uh, lithophile systems like neodymium 142. The other option is um, fractionation in a uh, large scale convecting uh, magma ocean or a magma ocean that's crystallizing. And here we can make some predictions about uh, what would happen with hafnium tungsten fractionation. We can make some corresponding predictions about samarium neodymium. But in this scenario, we have absolutely no predictive capability with regard to platinum, rhenium, and osmium. So these are our two best models. Either way, you know, they require a very early formed heterogeneity, probably within the first 30 million years of solar system history. 
because that's the time scale for indigenous tungsten growth. And if you're a fan of giant impacts, this is telling you that that mantle domain that uh, records the tungsten enriched composition had to have survived this event. So if you like models where you have a giant impact and it completely melts the earth and mixes everything up, you don't like the tungsten results that we came up with. Now, Sujoy, I think, is going to uh, give a talk in, what, a week or uh, next week. He's almost certainly going to talk about his uh, xenon results. And he will also argue that uh, there is probably a large scale differentiation event that, in his case, fractionated noble gases um, that survived this event as well. So there is multiple lines of evidence. Uh, I don't care. Somebody. You have two statements at the end of there. The moon forming impact did not completely melt the mantle and also did not completely homogenize they, the mantle. They're not you, synonymous. Are, are, so I understand <clears throat> the not chemically homogenizing the mantle. Is the first part also a consequence or, or is the, of, of your observations or is it um, I think, or is it the assumption that if it were completely melting, it would also be very well mixed? Yeah, that's result. sloppy wording too. Uh, no, it just tells us that it's not very, it's not completely mixed, so it doesn't have necessary implications for melting. And, and since I have the microphone, are there other commodities of the same age that do not show the anomaly? Oh, they're coming okay. in the talk. Okay. Patience. Uh, they're the coming very shortly. Sorry. Uh, I want to ask uh, whether the moon formation events comes first or the late Vernian comes first. Uh, that's another talk, but uh, to give you a short answer, I believe the moon forming event came first, followed by late accretion. Uh, if so, then uh, there is no way to make the Earth homogeneous because you still have late Vernian material go to the Earth. Yes, but you can't mix this reservoir out up to the time of the production of the commodities. So yes, you are by definition producing a, a, a heterogeneous mantle yes. by late accretion. But again, it's the same conclusion. You aren't mixing it away. Okay. So would you then say, I think the same, that moon should be low in high Moon should be, uh, the moon actually is low in its highly siderophile element uh, budget uh, in its silicate portion. And if you're quick thinking, you would also say if you had late accretion happening after um, the moon forming event and you added less stuff to the moon proportionally than the Earth, the moon should have a different tungsten isotopic composition. So you theoretically could say which fraction of this giant in factor was getting on air and which was partitioned mm -hmm. into a moon. Uh, perhaps. That's, a, that's yet another talk in that, uh, that delves into the issue of whether or not the Earth and uh, giant impactor formed a homogeneous cloud yeah. that uh, the moon formed from. So from a uh, dynamical or geochemical perspective, what phase within the mantle do you expect, or phases, do you expect the tungsten to be retained within for this X amount of time? Um, I can't answer that. I, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm searching for answers. And, you know, we're, uh, we're at the front end of the uh, modeling process of this. Okay. And hopefully I can encourage some of you. Which is charged in the oxidized state? Uh, Two, I think. Huh? Uh, three. Three. Yeah. Okay, you ask about other commodities. And uh, so here are some other commodity data that we have produced. Um, these are uh, some commodities from Ontario. They're 2.7 billion years. These are the Costa Muxha rocks. They're 2.8. Here are some other Russian uh, commodities from 2.4. Uh, 
And here are commodity commodities from 3.5. Yeah? In all of this, you are assuming that all of the tungsten went into the core in the beginning? No, we're no. assuming some of the tungsten went, uh, about 90% of the tungsten went into the core. And that's based, that's based on mass balance. So that's knowing what a chondritic tungsten concentration is and presuming we know the tungsten abundance in the silicate portion of the planet, we can determine a, a crude uh, core silicate earth distribution coefficient. And it's about 90% in the core. Okay? Okay, so here's where we get to the many surprises await stage. And uh, this is, alas, where uh, we have very limited data. I want to point out that, uh, you know, this is really a two-year project here. This, uh, this is a tremendous amount of work uh, to, to generate these data. These are really high precision data. So even once you get out of the chemistry lab, each analysis is about a 12-hour run and, and you run many more standards than you run samples. So this is, this is yeah. Um, here's our problem with the Meyer et al. model. Here's um, commodity down here. We agree with their estimate of the mantle abundances for the commodity commodityites, but the prediction is the commodity commodityites should have a tungsten anomaly enrichment because they don't have most of their late accreted component. And there may be a very, very small one, but it's not very impressive. And so that's, that's the problem. Now, um, this is, of course, one of these many. You called this few. This is a lot of data to a geochemist over here, a lot of data. Um, you know, maybe the next six that we do will we'll show tungsten anomalies to go with it, but um, we'll see. Uh, w was was commodity still the timing where we expect that there was more heterogeneity overall in the tungsten? Uh, the, the I would I would speculate that by 3.5 you you would have gotten rid of it. The, the these rocks beg to differ. So surely if there was heterogeneity at 2.8, there was certainly heterogeneity at 3.5. The problem in fitting this to this is you, ha you would have to find some way of decoupling the highly siderophile elements from the moderately siderophile elements in order to have this um, produced as a consequence of, uh, of insufficient uh, late veneer added to it. It should have a more radiogenic tungsten isotopic composition. I'm going to ask a question. Okay. Does the Impact history of the moon inform us about when the late addition, late accretion occurred on the Earth? Uh, that's a good question. So, so oftentimes uh, what's called late heavy bombardment uh, is uh, confused with the term late accretion or late veneer. Late heavy bombardment is what some people believe is responsible for the uh, basins on the moon that you can see. Uh, most people tend to believe those were generated around 3.9 billion years ago, very recently in terms of uh, planetary processes. The amount of mass brought to the Earth and Moon by that process uh, was pretty limited. So no, this is a, an, an event or events that occurred uh, probably substantially before late heavy bombardment and the processes associated with basin formation. Could uh, could the differences between the uh, the commodity and the more recent ones um, be related to what we heard about in Michael's last talk? I mean, so you know there wouldn't have been a lot of turnover, or you know what? I mean, just not as many turnovers in um, in the earliest ones. And so maybe you hadn't quite mixed it up, or maybe that's the elliptical point, whereas the other ones were more stretched out and then eventually got mixed up a billion years later. Well, so I we're sort of seeing... Yeah, I think you have to appeal to something like that for the fact that this survived until 2.8. 
that still doesn't deal with the uh, difference between these two. So those are really two different issues, how, lo how you can preserve a heterogeneity this long. And remember, neodymium-142, and, and it's different, neodymium-142 looks like it's mixed away by 2.7. Uh, this is still going strong. You could project this down to no heterogeneity by, I don't know, 2.1 or something like that. I don't think this is a trend. Um, so I'm going to guess that we're going to see robust heterogeneities in the Proterozoic, and I'm even going to go out on a limb and suggest we'll see tungsten isotopic heterogeneities in modern rocks. So whatever this is, uh, it's not mixing away very rapidly, or uh, it's at least not making itself inaccessible for a long period of time. Okay. Um, we should finish soon. Um, so I'll just finish up with a few slides. Uh, I, I posed the question, where do we go from here? And uh, again, we come back to mass spectrometry. We can make really, really precise measurements now for elements. Well, I just showed you data for uh, tungsten, and we've been working on the element ruthenium. And ruthenium is a highly siderophile element. It presumably was uh, dominantly added to the silicate earth by late accretion then, if you believe my story. And I'm just going to step through the uh, the the review of uh, meteorites, and to some extent, Ching Shu Yin uh, presented you with similar data. This is just to point out that uh, the early solar system, the building blocks of the Earth, now we get to the building block part of the talk, uh, consisted of matter that had uh, significantly different isotopic compositions. So these are, uh, this is a plot of uh, molybdenum isotope composition. Sorry about the plot, but it's a, a plot showing deviation in parts per 10,000 relative to you um, for different isotopes. And as Ching Shu pointed out, the reason these vary is because these different bodies, and notice these are different uh, chondrite groups up here, uh, picked up different proportions of materials produced by diverse nucleosynthetic processes. Okay, so there's absolutely no question, no one debates this. Different uh, asteroids that are still out there have different isotopic compositions. And if you add a large asteroid to the Earth with a different isotopic composition, you might ultimately be able to see it in the rock record. And I know this is true because you can go to places like uh, Chicxulub and measure the, for example, chromium isotopic composition. And on a very small scale, you see isotopic heterogeneities that are the result of nucleosynthetic differences. So here we've got molybdenum. Um, I'll just make the point that uh, molybdenum, the molybdenum isotopic composition of the Earth looks like enstatite chondrites, most like enstatite chondrites. There are some other elements like titanium and uh, chromium that uh, should have no relationship to the origin of molybdenum. They would not have been affected by late stage planetary accretion, and yet they too look most like enstatite chondrites, so I thought I'd throw that in just because we've discussed the uh, compositional models before. And uh, just to, to finish off, uh, ruthenium also shows very large nucleosynthetic heterogeneities. Many of them are not easily resolved, but uh, ruthenium-100 is. And so if you believe in a late accretionary model like uh, we have proposed, where you have a limited number of, they're not really particularly large bodies, but uh, Pluto mass bodies, a few Pluto mass bodies adding the highly siderophile elements to the planet rather than having a gentle snow of chondritic material to the Earth to create a late veneer, then you have a mechanism perhaps for implanting isotopic uh, signatures into the early mantle. So this is why I don't like the term late veneer. I believe in this rather than this for reasons I don't have time to go into. When people think of late veneer, they usually think in terms of a gentle snow of chondritic material onto the surface that can gently be mixed downward. 
And uh, this is my preferred uh, belief for the uh, understanding of how the highly siderophile elements got there. So you might end up with something like this, where you've created uh, some portion of the mantle that is very different in terms of its nucleosynthetic isotopic composition. And consequently, that is something that we are now looking for. So I will end there. Stay tuned. Everybody's hungry, so you've got to keep your questions to it. Uh, I think he had his hand up first. Um, it may be worth pointing out that even if you have a stochastic late accretion, sorry, that's the name that people normally associate with uh, the Botky et al. idea that you have several large bodies delivering your late accretion, late veneer rather than uh, a smaller array of bodies. You could still get a significant amount of your HSEs delivered to your surface because of the vaporization of the, of the impact. So although, yes, you're, you're, it's much more efficient at getting it into the mantle in terms of the mass core, you're still going to vaporize a significant amount of material, which is going to end up putting some component of that on your surface, which is more like the second picture, which is sort of more a sprinkling across the surface to be mixed in later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for uh, someone or some ones to model impacts of that size. So if anyone's interested in that, speak up. Go ahead. Yeah, I cannot do the modelization. But uh, just have a question of, on the very last part of the of the talk on the ruthenium isotope anomaly. Yeah. So I think, but correct me if I'm wrong, that we know that the mantle is, uh, we know the composition of the present day mantle. We do know the composition of the present day mantle. But we also know that there is a correlation in chondrites between ruthenium and molybdenum isotope isotope anomalies? We think we may have a correlation between ruthenium and the And the Earth is on the correlation. Mm. Sorry? So the, the Earth? Yeah, the Earth's mantle is on the correlation. What does it mean in terms of homogeneous versus heterogeneous I, accretion? I didn't pay you to ask that question, but here it is. Um, so this is something that uh, Nicolas Dofa recognized about 10 years ago. Uh, we still have very limited data. Uh, remember what I just told you. So the moderately siderophile elements like molybdenum added by final stages of Earth accretion, but maybe the last 10 to 20 percent of accretion. Ruthenium last half percent. There's absolutely no reason the Earth should plot on a uh, ruthenium molybdenum trend if the ruthenium in the mantle of the Earth and the molybdenum in the mantle of the Earth came from genetically different sources, meaning you could have the ruthenium uh, delivered by a CM chondrite, you could have the molybdenum delivered by an enstatite chondrite, and you would have something that dramatically falls off this correlation line. That's not what you see, but there's actually very limited data for this, and there are some deviations on it. So you could argue maybe we're not going to see any heterogeneities simply because everything was the same. It was an enstatite contract. No, it's, it wasn't an enstatite contract. Bill. So far, it, it's, it's, so far, he showed us only it showed us only positive epsilon uh, uh, mu tungsten anomalies. So if if it's a mixing thing, there should be negative ones somewhere, right? I agree. And uh, that is unfortunate if you are uh, on the lookout for a core component, because now we've polluted the industry. Uh, before finding positive anomalies, anything that would have shown up as negative, we would have probably immediately recognized as being a core component and written an appropriate paper. Uh, the fact that we have positive anomalies, yes, requires that there have been at least negative anomalies, and therefore, if you find a rock with a negative anomaly, it's not necessarily the core. Damn, you bet. <laughs> Anything else? If not, you are released until Monday morning. Oh, wait. <laughs>